Well, today we're going to be uh, starting a new series, and uh, we're going to be looking at uh, the book of James, or the epistle of James. And each week we're going to be uh, moving through this book and looking at this book in, in, uh, in a lot of detail to see practically how do I live as a Christian. If I am somebody who says, I believe in Jesus, the question is, what does that look like? How do I actively live for Jesus? If you're someone uh, in this room or watching this video online who says, I believe in Jesus, then the book of James is for you. It's a book to help you to live out your Christian faith. This book is full of practical Christian wisdom. Somebody has described the book of uh, James as being the book of the Proverbs of the New Testament. It's full of sayings and useful teachings for how we put this belief in Jesus into practice. On Monday morning, what does it look like that I'm a Christian? In my workplace, in my family, what does it mean that I am a follower of Jesus? And so that's hopefully what we're going to be looking at as we study through the book of James. Now I'm sure when I uh, said the book of James, many of you have already got one theologian's comments on the book of James burning in your minds. Uh, both Christians and non-Christians might think they understand and know Martin Luther's view of the book of James. Martin Luther once spoke saying, uh, of the book of James, he said it was an epistle full of straw. That was his comment on the book of James. It's a letter that lacks, you know, it's full of straw, so it lacks substance. It lacks great riches. But what Martin Luther was really dealing with and when he uh, said those comments isn't that the book of James isn't worth your time. What he was addressing was justification by faith alone. And many people would flick through the book of James. They'd point to a, a random bit of it. They'd pluck it out of uh, James, out of context. And they'd state it as, do this and be saved. Now, of course, we know the reality, don't we? Friends, we know the truth. That it is only by accepting Jesus Christ that you can get to heaven. It is only by what Christ has done on the cross. The only work that gets us to heaven is the work that Jesus has already done on the cross. That's what we believe. And so you, you might get a few people who pull these comments out and, uh, and say, well, Martin Luther didn't really think much of, uh, of this. But what Martin Luther really wanted to address was the reality of what it is to be a Christian. A lesser known quote by Martin Luther says, I think very highly of the epistle of James, and I regard it as valuable. It does not expound human doctrine, but lays much emphasis on God's law. Martin Luther knew and understood the meaning of this letter, the importance of this letter, the value of this letter. And so I don't want anyone to ever to say to you, well, Martin Luther didn't think much of that. Because uh, it's a commonly said thing, but I don't think it's true at all. In this book, we are going to be studying how real faith in Jesus Christ is demonstrated and lived out. And so, today is my sort of introduction to the book of James. For those of you who've never heard of it or never turned to it before or never read it in great amount of detail, this is my introduction for you. And my first point today is simply James, the author. Now the book is called, the, the letter is called, the epistle is called James, after the man who wrote it. And so that brings up a very obvious question, doesn't it? Who is this man who wrote this epistle? And what I want us to do is look at verse 1 and almost use it as an introduction to the whole book. Because there are some beautiful and glorious truths contained in the opening. 
And so uh, the end of uh, verse 1 mentions about the 12 tribes. This is who James is writing to. James is writing to Jewish Christians. Now many people, for a, a whole matter of reasons, which I can bore you with the details later, but many people think that James was one of the first books of the New Testament to be written. Many people think that the book of James is a very early book that was written. And I, I would tend to agree with that. The exact date, we don't know. Uh, many scholars would, would hazard a guess. But there's lots of things in the book of James that indicate it's a very early book. Some of those things include the fact that James is largely writing to Jewish Christians. And the reason for that is not because he's excluding the Gentile Christians. The reason for that is at this point of writing, most scholars think that the majority of Christians were Jewish of origins to begin with. There were many Gentiles who believed, but most of the church, many members of the church, would have been Jewish by tradition. This is the very early stages of the church's growth. And so if you believe in Jesus, what? How do you live? How do you work it out? How are you to treat people? That's all of the things that James is interested in doing. So who wrote this letter? Who is James? Well, the book is written by James, who many of us were, would agree is Jesus' brother. Some uh, theologians would make the distinction is actually Jesus' half-brother on the account that uh, they all share the same mother, but uh, in terms of the fathers, they are very different because of the way that Jesus was conceived. But this is clear from Scripture, biologically, Jesus' brother. And there would be some Christians that would disagree with that. Primarily, the, the Catholic Church would say that Mary remained a, a perpetual virgin, Despite the fact she was married and despite the fact she had children other than Jesus, still the, the Catholic Church's teaching would be that uh, Jesus had no brothers and sisters. But we read in Mark, uh, Mark chapter 6 and verse 3, without any doubt, Mark chapter 6 says, Is not this the carpenter, the son of Mary and the brother of James, uh, and of Judas and of Simon, and are not his sisters also with us? I think that's quite clear cut, isn't it? Are these not the son of Mary? Are these not, and his sisters are with us as well? Jesus had brothers and sisters. I think that makes it very clear. And James is one of Jesus's brother. We can presume from that the fact uh, that James is. The, the first person named, James was probably Jesus' eldest brother. Can you imagine growing up with somebody who's perfect? That must have been a struggle, wouldn't it? Constantly, everything you did, Jesus would always have done it better. However much you tried and worked, his life would have been perfect. And you might say, well, of course, Jesus' brother is writing a letter to defend Jesus. And to anyone who's thinking that, my, state, my, my first question would be, have you ever met brothers? Have you ever seen two brothers together? They, they cannot often uh, agree. And what I find really interesting about James is that James did not believe the resurrection at first. There's accounts of that in, uh, in John 7, verses 3 to 5. James wasn't quick to believe the resurrection. 1 Corinthians 5, 7 says, speaking of Jesus, then he appeared to James and then all the apostles. This person who is writing the book is an apostle of Jesus Christ. He's a brother of Jesus. He is, seen, he is someone who has seen the resurrected Jesus Christ. And I want you to understand this because this verse in 1 Corinthians 15 is fascinating because it's almost like James has a special encounter with Jesus. It says, then he appeared to James and then to all the apostles. 
It's almost like he met with James first. Or in a special way. We also read in Galatians 2.9 that this James, who authored the book, he is one of the leaders of the church in Jerusalem, with, along with uh, Cephas. He is one of the pillars of the church in Jerusalem. And the church in Jerusalem would have been one of the biggest churches at that time. This writer is a mighty man of God. And I hope I've stressed that enough. He is an apostle. He is the brother of Jesus. He is... Um, seen the resurrected Christ in a special and real way. This man is special. And then we read verse 1. James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ to the twelve tribes in the diasporation, greetings. My second point is James, a servant of God. This is fascinating. The great apostle, the great preacher, the great church religious leader, he says in a letter about himself, I am a servant of God. He doesn't say, I'm the brother of Jesus. I get my authority for my, uh, my heritage, for my lineage. He doesn't say, I've seen Jesus. I'm the, one of the guys Jesus picked to appear to. The humility in James to say, what am I? I'm a servant. I am a servant before Jesus. And I've entitled this sermon, Who is James and who are you? I want us to ask that question, who is this James and who are you? If you could invent your job title, if you're at work or when you were at work, if you could invent your job title, what would your job title have been? It probably would have had the word senior in it. It probably would have had the word manager in it. Or director. They all sound very posh and important. But here, James is introducing himself as servant. He is content to be nothing more than a servant. He's proud of it. He's happy with it. The one thing he wants you to know about himself is he is a servant to God. You can find some people, can't you, who are so quick to boast. Have you ever met those people who are so quick to boast? You're shaking their hands and they've barely said their name before they say something about themselves. You'll be shaking their hands and they'll be saying, uh, I've climbed Everest. Oh, okay, my name's Sam. Nice to meet you. Hello, what's your name? I'm a vegan. You know, ooh, lo lovely. Or whatever it is. There are some people who have to get a fact about themselves out there. For James, his fact is he's a servant. I would go as far to say that this is almost James's identity. Who is James? If you were to be able to define him, I would say James... He's a servant of God. That's how he wants everyone in the world to know him, to relate to him. Now, if I was to ask you a similar question, who are you? Don't worry, I haven't forgotten who you are, but, but deep down, I want you to think about it. Who are you? On a deep level, on a spiritual level, on an emotional level, who really are you? What would you say defines you? What is characteristically you? If, you were, if somebody was to say, describe yourself in, in a few words, what would you say? Two, three, four words. What is it about you? What is your identity? What are you rooted in? And some people can get a bit depressed by this. Some people think about themselves and they think, well... I'm not where I thought I'd be. I thought my career would be going better. I thought my relationships would be going better. I thought my money situation definitely would have been going better. I thought my health would be better. And many people can be really depressed at their identity, at who they are. And really, I want to say this, Christian, 
you must be anchored to the rock which cannot move, grounded firm and deep in the Saviour's love. My message to you as believers is that your identity should be, as James says, rooted in the unchanging God. If your identity of who you are is in anything except God, then you're in trouble. If your identity is in anything outside of Christ, then you are in danger because that thing can change. That job that you find your identity in, can so easily go. Your health can so easily go. Family. It... Friends, I urge you, root yourself. Define yourself. Identify yourself as being somebody who is in Christ. Why? Because in Jesus, that will never change. If Jesus died upon that cross for you, if Jesus loves you, if Jesus cares about you, if Jesus has forgiven you, then you are forever his. Forever. That is an identity worth building your life upon, isn't it? Any identity that is made without relationship to God is an identity which has ups and downs, changes and difficulties, struggles and difficulties. In your identity, I urge you to elevate God. Who am I? Well, I'll tell you who I am. I am a sinner in relation to God, but I'm saved by Him. I'm loved by Him. I am chosen. I am forgiven. And that is unchanging. Because if you are His now, you will always be His. Today, I belong to Jesus. Tomorrow, I belong to Jesus. The day after, I belong to Jesus. On my deathbed, I belong to Jesus. When I die and pass into glory, I will belong to Jesus. I am forever His. That is where my identity is. That is where John's identity is. It is rooted, uh, James, sorry, James's identity is rooted in God. I am a child of the King. I am one of Jesus' blood-bought people. And that cannot and will not change. He is a servant of God. Well, what does it mean for James to be a servant of God? It's clearly his identity. It's clearly his chosen topic. But what does it mean for James to be a servant? Well, for James, it was a vocational career change. He became an apostle. He dedicated his life to that. But for us, many of us in this room aren't going to change our lives around in that way. But what it does mean for James to be a servant of God is this. In every aspect of your life, are you acknowledging God? That's a big question, isn't it? It's a big question for a Sunday evening. In all of your ways, in all of your actions, in everything you do, say, and think, are you submitting to God? Are you going to say, I will follow Him? The problem with the world at the moment is the emphasis on, I want to do this, so I'm going to do it. I want to do this, so I'll go and do it. For James, to be a servant of God means to submit to the will, plans, and promises of God. Now that is a really unpopular message. Um, I, I can see a few angry faces at me already. It's, an, it's a not a happy message. It's not the message I want to hear. I am God of my own life, and if I want to do something, who is God to tell me I can't do it? But here, James finds contentment, rejoicing, love, happiness. He finds who he is in this fact that he will follow God. That he will submit to God. 
We are not the God of our own destinies. There is one mightier. There is one stronger. There is one more powerful than you. And as we hope and seek to serve God as believers, partly what that means is acknowledging his concerns. Acknowledging who he is. Understanding his will and plans, they're above ours. Can you imagine somebody's plans being more important than yours? It's hard, isn't it? But this is what we're called to be. Servants to God. And that means even submitting to God when it's difficult. When the Bible says to love your enemies, will you follow God then? That's a challenge. Sometimes it's hard enough to love your friends, but to love your enemies? Will you submit to God's will and commands there? To pray for those who persecute you. To pray for those who are imprisoning Christians. Are you going to submit to that? It's a real struggle and challenge. Will you submit to the will of God? And here's the thing, I don't know much, I'll be honest about that. I don't know much, but here's what I do know. I know the ending. I know the future. I know what is coming next. I know that the eternal future for everyone. Those who reject Jesus in this life will be rejected by him in the next life. And those who accept Christ in this life will be welcomed by him to heaven, to glory. One day, many of us who are trusting in Christ will hear these words. And they will be words of greatest and highest delight that can never be matched. This is what one day every Christian will hear. One day God himself will say, well done, good and faithful servant. And the question is, isn't that enough? You think, I've done nothing with my life. I don't know what direction I'm heading in. I don't know how many years I've got left. I haven't got this, or I haven't got that, or my relationship with this person is messed up. But friend, let me say to you, if you're following Jesus, you are a servant of God. What's better than that? What's better than one day you will be welcomed home by the Almighty and said, well done. When I was in school, I couldn't even get a well done from my teachers, let alone a well done from God himself, from the Almighty. And he will one day welcome me home. And everyone who is trusting in Jesus, he will welcome us home as his good and faithful servants. It was enough for James. It should be enough for us. And then my final point. What we see is one more final distinction in verse 1. James is a servant of God. Yes, that is true. But James also says that he is, James, a servant of God, and of the Lord Jesus Christ. James makes himself distinct now. This is the beginning of the New Testament church. And James says, Jesus Christ is my Lord. Unequivocally. No questions. No hesitation. No repetition. Christ is my Lord. That's his statement. He's a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. This is a declaration of divinity. Jesus is God. James is a Christian. And he declares that Jesus is Lord. Lord of his life. Lord of his future. Lord of his eternity. Lord of all. Do you have the same view of Jesus this evening? He is Lord of all. Christ is the Lord of the sky. 
Christ is the Lord of the trees, of the nations, of the climate, of the waters, of the mountains. Every inch and depth of this creation, Christ is Lord. Jesus is sovereign. And often we're very happy to accept that. That's a lovely thought, isn't it? It's good to know that someone is in control. Some of the decisions made in governments and parliaments, it's good to know that someone's in control. When you see about the destructive power of nature, it's good to know someone's in control. But there's a harder application. In your life, is Christ Lord of you? Of every area of your life, is Christ Lord? One of my favourite uh, theologians and uh, really one of my favourite historical figures uh, in general is, uh, is a brilliant thinker uh, in many areas, but uh, he's a former uh, Dutch Prime Minister, uh, Abraham Kuyper. And Kuyper, talking about Jesus, says this, There is not one square inch in the whole dominion of our human existence over which Christ who is sovereign over all, does not cry, mine. There is not one square inch in the whole dominion of our human existence over which Christ, who is sovereign over all, does not cry, mine. What is uh, Kuiper saying by that? Kuiper is saying, everything Christ is Lord of. Everything in this world and universe, Jesus declares his ownership over. He is the sovereign Lord of all of it. All of it he owns. King of heaven and earth by right is what we sing, isn't it? And we've already thought about the big impact. He's king, he's uh, Lord of the mountains, he's Lord of the sea, he's Lord of the sky, of the space, of planets. But then we consider, in my life, have I enthroned him as who he truly is? Is he the Lord of me, of my heart, of my life? Do I live to serve him? Do I live for him? Am I overwhelmed by the thought of my Saviour? Am I overwhelmed by the Lord who is above all? Now John quoted a, a kid's song this morning, and so I'm going to quote one this evening. See if you remember this one from when you were very little. Who is the king of the jungle? Who is the king of the sea? Who is the king of the universe? And who's the king of me? I'll tell you, J-E-S-U-S, -S, yes, he's the king of me. You see, so often when we think Jesus is Lord, what we're really saying is, he's the Lord out there. He's the Lord of the trees, he's the Lord of the material world. But what that really means is, he's the Lord of that and the Lord of us. Are we following him? James is a servant of him. Question is, are you submitting to him? And then I've got one final thing just to note. That Christ is Lord. And yet, this is how Matthew 20 verse 28 describes Jesus, who is Lord. For the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and give his life for the ransom of many. Isn't that wonderful? If earlier you were struggling with the concept that I don't want to be a servant to God, look at what Jesus Christ has done for you. For he has come down into this earth not to be served, not to be waited on. Christ came into this world to serve others to serve you and to give his life for the ransom of many. 
We're not called to worship God, to serve God, and to follow God just for the sake of it. He is deserving of it. He is glorious of it. But also we have Jesus as our example. Our example as we serve God, our example as we serve our Lord Jesus Christ is the servant king. King of all creation. King of the universe. King of me. But who freely, willingly died in my place. Our God, our Lord, gave himself up for us. And the question of the whole book of James is, in light of this, in light of the gospel, will you say and worship Jesus as your Lord? Will you live your life in light of what Jesus has done? And as this series continues, we're going to look and we're going to see because Jesus Christ has given me life, how can I live for this Jesus?